I have wanted to be a creator for two different reasons. I always love to make stuff. And I had this idea early on of like, if I can get good at making money, I can take care of my family. I won't be a burden on anyone else. Almost two years into the company, I started to get this rash on my leg. And I go into the doctor and he's like, yeah, you have shingles. I couldn't work. I couldn't take care of kids in the way that I wanted to. And my brain was just completely foggy. So I got really depressed. All the things that I thought I was good at, I couldn't do anymore. The company just kind of stalled out. We're at the point where like we're down quite a bit from our peak in revenue. It really came down to like shut it down or double down. Why did you say no to doing this the first time? Oh, because <laughs> I don't like being the center of attention. <laughs> We've always had it where the creators are the heroes of the brand. And so I always wanted it where, like, let's tell the stories of the creators and who we serve rather than my story. And I remember thinking so many people at ConvertKit are creators themselves. And it's built by people who know what it's like to live the creator journey. And I was like, all right. <laughs> yep, that is, that is that is true. That's my life. I was born in a little, some would call it a tiny house. Others might call it like a, a shack. My mom and dad were saving up money to be able to build their dream house. So I grew up in this environment of scarce resources and a willingness to be like, all right, well, let me figure out how to do that. Let me ask someone, let me get help. Let me pull together a community and let's just try things. A lot of other people that I encounter in life are like, oh, I can't do that. I don't have that skill. And so much of the creative mindset is like, I don't have that skill yet. I wanted to be a creator for two different reasons. One is that I always love to make stuff. I also love woodworking and the intersection of something that I made and then being able to make money from it. And so that then translated into computer graphics and learning Photoshop and web design and logos and on from there. But it was all about how can I make money as a creator. I grew up in a family where money was always scarce. My dad ran a Christian bookstore that was supported by donations. We always had food to eat, but there were a lot of times that, you know, there wasn't money for much else. And I just watched it always be like a constant source of stress uh, in my family, particularly between my parents. They divorced when I was 19. And that was something where I had this idea early on of like, if I can get good at making money, I can take care of my family. I won't be a burden on anyone else. I remember thinking I'd love to teach, you know, everything I know about uh, designing iOS applications. And the whole point of the book was that it would position me as an expert. And who else do you want to hire to design your iPhone app than the guy who wrote the book on it? I put the book out there. It's self-published. It's launched to my email list of 800 people. I thought, okay, I want to make $10,000 over the lifetime of sales from the book. And I ended up making $12,000 in the first day. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, this is amazing. Uh, it went on to sell $19,000 worth in the first week, and then it just kept selling. That book launched to a bigger audience. It was about 3,000 subscribers at this point. Did $26,000 in sales in the first day went on to sell $50,000 worth in the first month. I thought that Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, like all these social networks, that's where the sales would come from. And instead email is what drove like more sales than all the other social platforms combined. And I talked to a friend who lives here in Boise who's been in marketing for a long time. And I was like, Ron, like email is it's driving so many sales. And he just gives me this look, he's like, yeah, man. Like we've known that since 2002. <laughs> like, good job, welcome to the party. But I just discovered that email was amazing for connecting with your audience. And then you could also talk to people differently, right? I could send out one email to the people who had bought and say, hey, what do you think? Will you write a review? And people who hadn't bought yet, I could email them and say, here's a review. And you can't do that on the other platforms. I just, I loved email as a platform. I loved how personal it was as a medium. And I just found that MailChimp was really limiting. And so what I would do is use my skill as a web designer and I would code like custom solutions. 
And then I eventually decided like, one, I wanted my own email solution. I was like, I want something that's built for creators, for writers, for bloggers, you know, for people like me. And then the other thing is I was doing these product launches and you get this huge spike in revenue, right? You get uh, $12,000, $25,000 in a day, and then it, it naturally drops off. And so I thought, one, this is amazing. And two, what if this doesn't continue? You know what would be amazing is recurring revenue, where people pay for something, I can sell a product and they pay for it over and over again. In my whole world, my whole background is software. And so I thought, okay, I wanna get back into building software. And so I launched something called the Web App Challenge, where I said, I'm going to grow a software company to $5,000 a month in recurring revenue in six months. I was only gonna do it with $5,000 of my own money. Everything else had to come from customers. Oh, and I'm gonna live blog the entire thing. I think it'd be easy to say that things just took off from there. And that's not at all what happened. I think that's, you know, more true to the creator experience. It's never a smooth process. At the six month mark, we weren't at 5,000 a month in revenue. We were at like almost 2,000 a month. And it's like, on one hand, people were like, oh, so you failed, are you gonna shut that down? And I was like, no, no like 2,000 a month is great. You know, we have this great uh, trajectory. It'll keep growing from there. I was doing other things too. Like I wrote a book uh, called Authority, which was about everything I learned about building an audience and self-publishing. That overlapped nicely with ConvertKit. You know, it was the kind of people who would read Authority would want to use ConvertKit. But this is where, you know, we kind of hit a plateau with ConvertKit. The product actually wasn't very good yet. So people signed up and pre-ordered on the hype of what it would be, but it was taking time to turn into that so people would cancel. So the next year, the company just kind of stalled out. And company is a strong word. It was me and some freelancers, you know? And like the revenue didn't grow. And not only that, I discovered the downside of recurring revenue. Everyone talks about the upside. The downside is something called churn. And that's the cancellations that come in when people say like, oh, this isn't what I need anymore. My business has changed. Or like, your product's just not that good. And it ended up gradually shrinking from about 2,000 a month in revenue to uh, about 12 to 1300 a month in revenue over the next year. And that was pretty tough because everyone says that you should stick with it. It's just a matter of time. And I did that for a long time and it, it didn't work. And I now had these three books that were selling really well. In 2013, I made $250,000 as a creator uh, online, which is just absolutely wild. And I decided that I was going to take some time away. Um, our second child was born, uh, his name's August. We had bought a house and we were remodeling it and we were going to move into it. And so there's a lot of things going on. So, so I said, I made plenty of money. I'm gonna take a step back and just focus on all the other life things. And that went really well. Uh, August was a super easy baby for the first two months. And then he got a bit sick. And then Oliver, who was two and a half at the time, he got sick as well. And I remember thinking like, I'm taking time away from work. So I'm gonna take care of everything, right? And so I'm getting up with both kids, trying to handle everything that I can and not really sleeping. And it was just, there's a lot going on, but I felt like I could, I could handle it. And that was until I started to get this rash on my leg and I go into the doctor and he's like, yeah, you have shingles. Is there anything that has caused like an elevated amount of stress in your life recently? And I was like, uh, well, I'm moving, remodeling a house. Oh, and I have a two week old baby. And the doctor like laughs and goes like, yeah, that'll do it. That was a pretty rough time. I felt pretty useless, actually. I couldn't work. I couldn't take care of kids in the way that I wanted to. Couldn't support Hillary the way that I wanted to. Because it's hard, but it's like, look, this is just brought on by stress. All you can do is <laughs> take this medication and rest. And my brain was just completely foggy. Like I would sit down to write or sit down to create and I just couldn't. I used to really pride myself on how much I could get done, right? How fast I could work. And that was gone. And the more frustrated I got at my inability to create, the worse it got. What I realized is when you derive your self-worth from what you accomplish, if your ability to accomplish and create things ever goes away, like you've actually built it all on a really shaky foundation. So I got really depressed. Growing up, emotion was always scary. Several family members were very explosive. And so watching that conflict, 
you know, emotion was always very scary and I didn't ever go there. And I think in that process, it left me without the tools to like to express or to feel what I was going through. And I, I, I mean, I got to the point that I didn't want to live anymore. And I went through like several different periods of really dealing with feeling suicidal. And it was just really, really challenging. It felt empty. All the things that I thought I was good at, I couldn't do anymore. I had gotten really good at creating so that I wouldn't be a burden on other people. And I felt like I'd lost that ability. In that moment where we had two little kids, one being just a few months old, I felt like I was also a burden on my wife. And I'd worked so hard to get to the point where that would never be the case. <laughs> was I had a good friend who really noticed what I was going through and would sit down and have long conversations and try to talk through it and really recommended that I go to counseling it was a long journey to come out of all of that I think separating your self-worth from really anything that you've assigned it to for me it was what i created but i think for other people it's maybe how those creations are perceived how the youtube comments or the newsletter replies come in i think it's really hard there's not some moment that things switch and you're like go from i am valuable because of what i contribute to the world to just to just being able to say, I am valuable and in a sense there. And like, there's not gonna be one moment that makes that happen. It's gonna take surrounding yourself with people who reinforce that message. It's probably gonna take having some time and space from your work. So you realize that there's more to life than your YouTube followers, your newsletter subscribers or whatever else. And it takes a lot of looking at why you're creating something. It's easy as a creator to create the next thing for the numbers. And there's just so many things I've realized. Like, I got into being a creator, one, because I love it. And two, so that I could be independent, so that I could travel, so I could give myself the remote job <laughs> that other people wouldn't hire me for. And so just taking a step back and saying, it's so much more than the numbers. So now almost two years into the company, we're down quite a bit from our peak in revenue. The product's a bit better, but still not great. People aren't signing up. And at the same time, I, I, my other creator ventures are going pretty well. I now have three books out at this point. They're selling well. And I'm using ConvertKit for my own list. And it's like, it's a little rough around the edges, but this is the tool that creators should use. And I was at a conference and a friend of mine named Heaton Shaw, he run several successful software companies. We were walking back from a dinner, just talking about various things. And he just like stops for a second and goes, you know, Nathan, you should shut down ConvertKit. And I remember thinking about that, like just being totally shocked because we were actually talking about something entirely different. And he just says it like basically out of the blue. That's kind of a rude thing to say. Like I've poured a lot of time into this. This really matters to me. I've put my heart and soul into it. And he's like, yeah, you're going to be successful at plenty of things that you do. You're almost two years into ConvertKit at this point. It doesn't have traction, it's shrinking. You should shut it down. And then he just like stops again, looks at me and goes, or you can take it seriously. You can give it the time, money and attention it deserves and like build it into a real company. But right now you've got your books and your blogging and you still have your iPhone apps. You've got a bunch of these other things going on and you, you're split between a lot of it. Like decide what you want. It really came down to like shut it down or double down. And I'd like to say that in that moment, I was like, oh, double down, definitely. Like, you know, and I jumped right into it. <laughs> but I think I did what a lot of people do when they get good advice. And that's like ignore it for six months <laughs> and then act on it. And so the revenue, like it got worse. You know, we went further downhill. And then it finally got to this point where I think I looked at the amount of money I was losing every month on ConvertKit because it wasn't even covering its own expenses. 
And I was like, okay, I have to make a decision. And I had put together a little bit of a framework of how to make this decision. And I'd come up with two questions. The first was, do you still want this as much today as the day that you started? Because if not, that's fine. Like, there's all kinds of things that we start as creators where it's like, oh, this is going to be the best. I'm going to write this book. I'm going to launch this project, this podcast, YouTube channel, whatever it is. And then a month later or a year later, you're like, I don't actually want this anymore. And then you can just let that go. That's fine. So when I thought about that for me, it was like, yeah, I still want this. Like, I want this next challenge. I want to be the CEO of a software company. I want the recurring revenue. Like, this is the next thing for me. It's like, okay, well, it's not working still. Like, it's great that you want it, but it's not working. So the next question that I asked is like, have you given this every possible chance to succeed? Is this truly your best effort? Because if yes, like that's fine too. All kinds of things that you really, really want and you give it your absolute best effort to don't work. That's part of being a creator. But if you have done that and you know in good faith like that is everything you had, then like let it go. You can know that that was your best effort. And for me, there was this disconnect. Like I thought about it and I was like, well, I've been working on it part-time. I haven't put in that much money. If I quit today, I'm always gonna wonder like, could I have made that work? And so I was thinking like, okay, I, I, I think I need to focus on this. And I think it needs real money. But if you're gonna go raise money, having a company that's been shrinking for the last year is not a good position to raise money from. <laughs> like, I didn't even try because that would be a disaster. And so I remember talking to Hillary and just feeling like I should double down on this. But we were in a position where we had bought a house. We had two kids now. We just remodeled our house. Like, it was a big deal. You know, I'm saying, here's this thing that makes money for us with the books and the blog. I'm going to ignore that. And I want to take most of our savings and like retirement funds and put it into this company that has been shrinking for years. And she was like, you should do it. <laughs> I was just shocked that I thought I'd have to convince her and that she's like, no, absolutely, you should do it. I think it was a year later or more. I asked her, what made it so easy for you to say like, yes, absolutely, we should, we should do this. And she shared that at the time, I didn't do anything. I was so depressed. She was just hoping that, like, she saw the little bit of energy that I had and the excitement that I had that maybe I could make this work. And she hoped that that would be the spark that would get me out of this, like out of this depression. And it was. <laughs> that was the inflection point for ConvertKit. That was early 2015, two years into the company. There were a lot of people early on who felt like it would be much better to stay focused on books. Like why stop something that's going so well? I think anytime as a creator that you pursue something new, there's gonna be people who are saying, you shouldn't do it. This other thing is more interesting. And it's especially hard when you can't explain why you're doing the new thing. But like everything in my gut is saying, go after this, like put all the resources, like make this happen, go as fast as you can. And yes, it's making $2,000 a month and the books are making $50,000 a month. But I think when you have that gut feeling of like, no, this can be something, then you have to follow it. There's always going to be people in the YouTube comments or who are replying to your newsletter who are like, oh, this isn't a good idea, you shouldn't do it. But it's a harder when it's people that you really care about and respect. And it's just a tough balance. Sometimes you should listen to them, but then other times if they're saying things that you don't agree with and you've thought about it, you've taken their perspective into account, then you just have to go with it anyway. And to say that I'm glad that I went with it would be the understatement of the year. So I took $50,000 out of our retirement savings and I put it into the company. Uh, I hired someone to work on it full time, so I wasn't gonna do contractors anymore. And instead of being like email marketing for anyone, pivoted to email marketing for professional bloggers and started doing direct sales and the business exploded from there. By the end of the year, we closed out at 98,000 a month in revenue. And <laughs> of course, like most creators, instead of like celebrating the wild change from 2,000 to 98,000 a month, I was like, ah, so close to 100. Like we were so close. But it was an insane year. And it really came down to doing all of those things that don't scale, like putting in all of that work to build the word of mouth. And then once that kicked in, 
you know, people were talking about ConvertKit. It was, you know, powered by ConvertKit was showing up in emails and landing pages. Then it just started growing, you know, faster and faster than we could even handle. I think I thought pretty small. And then I realized, oh, once we build something that people want, like we could build this to a million dollars a year, $10 million a year, now 30 million and on our way to 100 million a year. And uh, I think that's true for pretty much all creative businesses. It's like, if you change the group that you're spending your time around, you know, and that shapes your mindset, then you can turn something into a much, much bigger business. I think the first time getting the whole team together was a dream come true moment. We were up in the mountains outside of Boise. There were 21 people on the team. And I remember this moment of sitting around in the living room of this like big 10 bedroom house and just really enjoying seeing everyone being together uh, for the first time. <laughs> and then I had this moment of like, it feels like everyone's waiting for something. Like it's time for, you know, someone to lead this. And then realizing like, oh, that's me. And as I think I matured in my own journey of switching from, okay, how do I earn a living as a creator to really establishing the company mission to be, we exist to help creators earn a living. The shift for me was realizing it's not me taking center stage. It's me sharing this mission and being the, the spotlight or the voice for this mission that we're all doing together. And I think that just makes such a huge difference. Knowing that we have a reason to all be together that's much bigger than like, I'm the CEO, pay attention to me, this is my company or something like that. It's like, there's a much bigger thing that we're all doing together. And all of those company presentations that we do revolve around the stories that we're telling, the creators that we serve. When you talk to someone about what it means to be a creator, if they're a creator, often they'll talk about like, oh, I'm not a creator. Like that's some lofty thing to live up to. Or they'll say, I'm not a creator, I'm a podcaster or a author or something else. Like they'll list a specific type of creator. I think we're really just looking for an umbrella term for someone who not just makes something, because lots of people make things. You might have your, your hobby, right? Where you're knitting or woodworking or, or journaling or whatever else. And I think it's important to define creator as for other people. Someone who, you know, inspires and teaches other people, right? It's not just uh, for your own gratification. It's uh, to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm.